Sarah's chief research interests, as you're going to see, are about the historical um, construction of uh, Jewishness in American uh, social and legal history. Um, and she is really a historian of Jewish identity, a historian of religion. Um, and her work both on issues of gender and on Jewish identity, as well as her work on the history of the discipline of religious studies, which is another area we're not going to hear a lot about today, but is an important part of her historical work on disciplinary history, both have brought her into engagement um, with law and with legal sources and the social and uh, juridical uh, facts around law. We're going to see a little bit of that today, of course, in the talk, but what we're also going to see is her chief current research interest, which is in gender, in the construction of gender, in the construction of gender around minority groups, around religion. And she is, in fact, uh, just completing a book called Masculinity and the Making of American Judaism, which is what this talk is drawn from. And so you're in for a treat. She's a, um, a widely recognized, truthfully, as a rising star in religious studies, and we're delighted to have her here. So uh, please well, join me in welcoming Sarah, and we'll have a chance for conversation. Okay, I think the worst part is officially over, having to sit and listen to a long and glowing introduction about oneself. Um, I have to thank Ben Berger so much for inviting me. This is really wonderful. Also, my thanks go to David Kaufman, who's in Jewish studies and promises me that he'll trickle in late after he's done teaching. Um, so the past couple days, I've been poking around the archives here, and I learned that in the late 60s and early 70s, some of the students affectionately referred to the campus as the construction site. And so as a historian, I'm fascinated to see that you're really getting back to your roots. <laughs> In 1908, New York City Police Commissioner Theodore Bingham announced in the North American Review that half of the city's criminals were Jews. Adding insult to injury, he insinuated that Jews pursued only the cowardly life of crime. The crimes committed by Russian Hebrews are generally crimes against property. They are burglars, firebugs, pickpockets, and highway robbers when they have the courage. In 1913, the inflammatory politician Tom Watson announced of Atlanta businessman Leo Frank, who was standing trial for murder, here we have the typical young libertine Jew who has an utter contempt for the law and a ravenous appetite for the forbidden fruit, a lustful eagerness enhanced by the racial novelty of the girls of the uncircumcised. In 1924, Nathan Leopold and Dickie Loeb confessed to kidnapping and killing a 14-year-old boy. During the nationally covered sentencing hearing, one phrenologist pronounced Loeb to be a boy of a feminine type, and a journalist discussed his delicate hands. Leopold was notable for his lack of physical prowess in athletics, opined another, and rumors of a sexual pact between the two of them circulated throughout the hearing. These three events, one, a statistical error and public relations blunder, one, a trial and lynching of a man innocent of murder, and one, a sentencing hearing of two young murderers, seem to be only distantly related. The 1908 Bingham affair highlighted both tensions and attempts to create a unified Jewish community, inclusive of immigrant Jews and also the acculturated Jews of New York City. The Leo Frank trial brought highly complex relations between whites and blacks, uh, native southerners and Yankees, and workers and capitalists in Atlanta to the attention of the nation. The Leopold and Loeb hearing became an occasion for phrenologists, uh, progressive social activists, and even fundamentalists and modernists to debate about the nature of crime, punishment, and why these Chicago Jews had gone so wrong. So what can these seemingly isolated events show us about the relationship of gender, religion, and criminality. Today, I'll draw out the connections and similarities of these three events to show some of the contours of Jewish masculinity, in particular, as it was co-produced with cultural ideas about religion and crime. Each of these three moments painted a similar picture of Jewish men. They lacked physical courage, they had a distaste for violence, and they preferred manipulation over brawn for criminal acts. For some observers, 
the Jewish criminals embodied these abnormal traits and were therefore guilty. But for others, Jews' different, softer, gentler masculinity constituted an argument for their innocence. These events violated social norms. Crime, by its very nature, is abnormal. It's not abnormal in the sense that it's uncommon, but rather in the sense that defining something as crime means locating it outside of social norms. And here lies one of the values of studying cultural conversations about crime. They paint a picture of the undesirable, the sorts of acts and persons beyond cultural norms. These three moments also constructed Jewish men outside of the bounds of normative masculinity. And lastly, each subtly constructed an idea of religion and suggested that deviation from that idea also was a deviation from social norms. Public conversations about crime provided an opportunity for Americans to reify their own sense of the boundaries of the normal. If certain Jewish men represented non-normative gender and also criminal activity, people could reassure themselves that those men and their gender and sexuality were different and perhaps even dangerous. The Jews who stood accused of these crimes also stood accused of social and gender deficiencies, cowardice, weakness, lack of patriotism. For many, these crimes showed that criminality and deviation from normative masculinity were inseparable. For those who defended Jewish men, Certain elements of a different masculinity, this aversion to physical violence, mildness, privileging brains over brawn, were all evidence of how Jewish difference contraindicated criminality. These defenders, who included both Jews and non-Jews, also argued that Jews were quite inside the boundaries of the normal. As good citizens who worked, supported wives and children, practiced an enlightened religion, and loved their country, Jewish men lived up to many of the norms of masculinity. But, they would say, Jewish crime was different from non-Jewish crime, these defenders are arguing, and such non-violent masculinity is a good thing. In the unfortunate cases that suggested otherwise, these defenders claimed, the failure was not their Jewishness, but rather their deviation from Judaism. Both sides relied on the cultural power of this nexus of gender difference, abnormality, and criminality to make their points. If Jewish gender difference was abnormal, Jewish criminality would make sense. People who violated one set of social norms, the norms of masculinity and heterosexuality, could violate others, such as law. On the other side of the discourse, Showing that Jewish sexuality was normal, that is, heterosexual, family-oriented, would aid the case that there was nothing particularly criminal about Jews at all. As Michel Foucault suggests, the social construction of the criminal is intimately related to the social construction of abnormal sexuality. The criminal who violates both the law of the land and the law of nature is, for Foucault, the major model for every little deviation. Legal and medical discourse could construct a criminal as beyond the definitive edge of the normal, or it could construct a normal person as non-criminal, but either way, the line between normality and abnormality largely mapped onto the line between criminality and legality. In this sense, public discussion of crime created and reinforced the boundaries between the normal and the abnormal. Analysis of these cases, then, allows us to see examples of those close ties of the abnormal and the criminal. But they'll also allow us to see how religion participated in these discourses and constructions. The Bingham Affair emphasized the cultural consensus about a Jewish male aversion to violence and physical aggression, and the idea of religion as preventative or antidote to crime. The Leo Frank case demonstrates the stakes involved in the construction of Jewish masculinity. His defenders insisted that he was normal with respect to gender, sexuality, and religion, while his detractors and murderers insisted he was abnormal. Leopold and Loeb show us what counted as normal, that is, healthy male bodies, heterosexuality, proper religion, and what counted as abnormal, that is, diseased male bodies, homosexuality, perverted religion. Okay, 1908. 
It is not astonishing that with a million Hebrews, mostly Russian, in the city, one quarter of the population, perhaps half the criminals should be of that race, Bingham announced in his 1908 North American Review article. And thus, the firestorm began. Although Bingham would soon retract his statistics, it turned out that Jews were slightly underrepresented among New York criminals, the accusation stirred discussion among both Jews and non-Jews about the nature of Jews and criminality. Some responded with thinly disguised anti-Semitism, others defended Jews as lawful citizens, but almost all agreed that when Jews committed crimes, they were of a certain sort. Murder, assault, drunkenness, and abuse were decidedly un-Jewish. Jews were not inclined to these masculine crimes and vices. In his article, Commissioner Bingham explained that the large number of Russian Jewish criminals, Russian is a shorthand for Eastern European Jews in general, should come as no surprise, quote, when the circumstance is taken into consideration. This circumstance, he imagined, included the history, culture, and although he wouldn't have used the word, the gender of New York Jews. Lack of assimilation, he explained, quote, particularly among men not fit for physically hard labor, is conducive to crime. Bingham's logic shows this knot of associations about criminality and masculinity. Proper men, especially immigrants, should be physically fit and labor for a living. Those who did not failed to abide by the norms of manliness. Bingham also thought they failed to abide by the norms of law. If Jewish men were not fit for physical labor, how could these weaklings be criminals? Bingham told a tale of a pattern of nonviolent crimes. The crimes committed by the Russian Hebrews are generally crimes against property. They're burglars, firebugs, pickpockets, and highway robbers when they have the courage. This is fascinating. I mean, New York police commissioner says that some crimes require courage, right? Um, he also implied that Jews don't commit those crimes that require courage. He inst instead, they committed crimes where they didn't have to confront human victims directly. Bingham chose pickpocketing as the paradigmatic example of Jewish crime, explaining, though all, their crime, although, though all crime is their province, pickpocketing is the one to which they seem to have taken the most naturally. He noted, quote, the superiority of the Russian Hebrew in that gentle art. <laughs> yes, courage, art, just what you expect from a police commissioner. Uh, far from requiring strength, prowess, or courage, picking pockets, as practiced by Jewish men, was gentle because it relied on manipulation rather than intimidation of its victims. Because of their weak bodies and lack of physical courage, Jewish men were neither physically equipped for productive labor nor emotionally equipped for dangerous crime. As if to emphasize the lack of physical strength and manliness required, Bingham singled out Jewish boys not even men, as the paragons of the pocket-picking art. Among the most expert of all the street thieves are Hebrew boys under 16 who are being brought up in the lives of crime. Many of them are old offenders at the age of 10. If the choice crime of Jews is picking pockets, and some of the most skilled pickpockets are mere children, it could not be a dangerous, violent, or manly crime. Bingham also described a con in which a Hebrew, Italian, and a Greek were arrested together for picking pockets. The Hebrew, he explained, was, quote, always selected for the tool, as the professional ter professional's term, that one who does the actual reaching into the victim's pocket. The others, meanwhile, would create a distraction or start a fight. So even when the Jewish criminal worked with other immigrant criminals, he would be the one to do the gentle task that required finesse while others did the fighting. Bingham's characterization of Jews as soft criminals and the Jewish community's agreement is all the more remarkable given the reality. New York City had a number of violent Jewish criminals, some of whom were growing quite famous. Although the heyday of Jewish gangsters would be a generation later, there were a number of Jews hurting, intimidating, and even murdering within the city limits. Just five months earlier, on May 18, 1908, two Jewish mobsters were shot to death at Coney Island by a member of a rival gang. Louis the Lump Piogi ambushed and gunned down Max Kid Twist Zweifach, who ran the Eastman gang, and his associate Samuel Cyclone Louis Teich. Ready? 
a former wrestler and Coney Island sideshow strongman who was famous for twisting iron bars around his arm and neck. Two more stereotypically violent men would be hard to come by. Um, earlier that year, they had first Piagi to jump out a second story window at gunpoint, motivated merely by schadenfreude and their own amusement. So despite these colorfully violent Jewish criminals, Bingham never mentioned Jewish gangsters, murder, or intimidation. They just did not fit his characterization of the kind of criminals that Jewish men became. Although Bingham was suspicious of all immigrant groups, he depicted Jews alone as simultaneously criminal, physically weak, and cowardly. He fumed about the audacity of Italian cold-blooded, premeditated murderers and kidnappers. And he also retold at length the story of an Italian who had the courage to stand up to a gang of blackmailers, which involved violence both ways. The gentle art of Jewish crime and the lack of aggressiveness or courage of Jewish criminals stood in sharp contrast to the audacity and courage of Italian criminals. Bingham's explicit comparison shows that his assumptions about Jews were not merely reducible to their status as immigrants, working class men, or non-native English speakers. Bingham was no big fan of Italian criminals, but he did not suggest that they were cowardly or weakly. Jewish criminality alone took the hue of cowardice, weakness, and gentleness. Bingham was hardly alone. William McAdoo, his predecessor as commissioner, had written in 1906, the East Side Jew rarely commits a crime such as assault and murder. Among themselves, disputes are mostly confined to wordy arguments. <laughs> Sociologist Edward Ellsworth Ross, who is known for his nativist stand, agreed. Because Jews were, quote, too cowardly to engage in violent crimes, they count on shrewdness. Others took these very same characteristics and explained what seemed like liabilities, physical smallness, aversion to fighting back, were actually assets. For instance, the journal The American Hebrew explained, that Jews are less addicted to crimes of violence may be put down to their slighter physique and general tendency to suffer ills without retaliation. Yes, Jews are smaller, the American Hebrew agreed, but that physiological fact led away from violent crime. Combined with a social and perhaps even religious propensity <laughs> to turn the other cheek, Jewish smallness meant that vices of aggression rarely afflicted Jews. Even Mark Twain had written, the Jew is not a brawler or a rioter. With murder and other crimes of violence, he has little to do. He is a stranger to the hangman. In the police court's daily role of assaults and drunken disorderlies, his name rarely appears. He has a reputation for various small forms of cheating and for burning himself out to get the insurance, but he seldom transgresses the laws against crimes of violence, Twain said. When Bingham made his announcement about Hebrew criminals, the New York Jewish community responded quickly. Most Jewish responses implicitly agreed with Bingham's characterization of the nature of Jewish crimes, even though they vehemently disputed the statistics. No, perhaps half was entirely too large an estimate. But the type of crime, pickpocketing and insurance schemes, not assault or murder, were a different story. Yes, they assented, there, Bingham was right. Even as the two sides disagreed about how many Jews committed crimes, they agreed about something fundamental. Both assumed that Jewish men did not commit violent crimes. From all of these points of view, American Jewish masculinity excluded aggression and violence. Even when Jewish men went wrong, they went wrong in distinctive ways that were not stereotypically masculine. Guarding against a future Bingham affair quickly became a communal goal for New York Jewry. They could refute statistics, and they did, but that was like putting out fires, and what they wanted to do was prevent the fires in the first place. And, in a way, they decided that religion was the answer. Spurred by Bingham's statements, Jewish leaders met with the goal of establishing a unified voice for the Jewish community of New York. As Arthur Gorin has shown, the idea and the challenge was to represent the entire Jewish community, immigrant and native, Russian and German, Orthodox and Reform, Ashkenazi and Sephardi. The diversity of language, culture, income, occupation, education, geography, and religious practice was vast. How could one organization represent all of these people? The leaders decided that religion, not nation or race or politics, would be the unifying aspect. That meant 
that the Judaism it represented would have to be fairly nondescript. The official statement announced that the organization's purpose, quote, shall be to further the cause of Judaism in New York City and to represent the Jews. They'd intentionally changed the original wording to emphasize the cause of Judaism. The antidote to crime, or at least the charge of crime, was religion. And interestingly, the particulars of that religion, its theology, its practice, its texts, even its ethics, played almost no role in their argument whatsoever. It was almost as if the idea of religion as such was enough to ward off the idea of criminality. 1913. The facts of the Leo Frank case were a tabloid's dream. The murder of a white girl, a story about capitalists versus the working class, a dollop of North versus South animosity, changing testimonies, charges of corruption of evidence, and an undeniable racial tension. Leo Frank, a Jewish factory superintendent in Atlanta, had one of the most sensational trials of the decade. A 13-year-old girl named Mary Fagan was found murdered in his Atlanta pencil factory. And although both police and Pinkertons milled around the crime scene quite a lot, the evidence was highly contested. After briefly considering the factory's black janitor Newt Lee for the murder, they turned to Frank, who had been the last to see her alive when she came to pick up her paycheck that Saturday. Frank was arrested, given a highly publicized trial, and convicted of the crime. His conviction was largely based on the ever-shifting testimony of Jim Conley, a black employee of the factory, and the public's racist conviction that Conley was not smart enough to fabricate a story or answer questions falsely on the stand. After numerous unsuccessful appeals, <laughs> Governor Slayton of Georgia commuted Frank's death sentence to life in prison. Not long after he survived an attack by a fellow inmate, a mob dragged Frank out of the jail and lynched him. Even before Frank went on trial, the media began to emphasize the difference of his gender. The Atlanta Constitution described him as, quote, a small, wiry man wearing eyeglasses of high lens power. He is nervous and apparently high strung. His dress is neat, he is a fluent talker, and he is polite. Many supporters agreed that Frank was differently gendered, but they emphasized a kind of genteel masculinity. Small in stature, big in mind, the Washington Post wrote. Frank is a man small of stature, but gives the instant impression of high culture and intellectual virility. His eyes are sharp and clear, even behind the glasses he always wears. His voice has a velvet softness, yet it's strong and manly in tone. Elsewhere, Frank was of retiring disposition and deeply interested in charitable work. Not characteristics of a strong, brave, or assertive manliness, but rather of a more gentle and genteel masculinity. Frank was not effeminate, claimed his supporters, but neither was he a physically strong specimen. The particular gendered and sexualized portrait of Frank contrasts with more common images of murderers in the South. The non-aggressive, manipulative, and wily capitalist was hardly the typical image of a murderer. Exploiter of workers, sure. Murderer, no. In fact, we might have expected the media and the, prosecu the prosecution to mobilize the most common stereotype of racial others accused of violent crime. Brutish, crude, uncivilized black men who raped white women. But Frank was none of these things, even according to his most outspoken detractors. A former police commissioner hinted at these stereotypes when he explained, the psychology of the murderer, as surely was proven by his crime, was that of a brute, crude, undeveloped. Frank is highly developed, a gentleman, a scholar. In addition to insinuating Frank's deviance from normative American masculinity, some publications, those convinced of Frank's guilt, suggested that he was sexually abnormal. When Conley took the stand, he announced that Frank had said, of course you know I ain't built like other men, which Conley went on to explain was a reference to sexual habits and anatomy. Although in retrospect there's no proof, during and after the trial, people accused Frank of everything from homosexuality to philandering to rape. The Atlanta Constitution reported that an unnamed employee said that Frank had indulged in familiarities with his young employees. Three days later, the Constitution reported that a policeman said he had seen Frank take a young girl to a desolate spot in the woods for immoral purposes. Later, the policeman recanted. Even the attorneys dwelled on Frank's sexuality. 
prosecutor Hugh Dorsey suggested that Frank had made multiple unwanted advances toward an office boy. The boy flatly denied it. At another point, apropos of nothing, Dorsey asked an employee if he had heard of Frank kissing girls and playing with the nipples on their breasts. I think that the employee here demonstrated a lot of restraint, asking where else would they be? <laughs> he asked witnesses if Frank took girls in his lap at the factory, or walked unannounced into the women's dressing room, or tried to take a girl with him when the factory closed. At first, we might imagine that the prosecutor's continuing insistence on discussing Frank's numerous sexual encounters, um, most of which were denied, would paint an image of virility the very stereotype of the masculine. But this picture of sexual advances toward the young was instead cast as a misdirected and criminal impulse. Both Frank's defenders and his detractors assumed that perversion would mean guilt. And if Frank were sexually normal, it would indicate his innocence. The Washington Post. Once persuade a jury that a man is a pervert and it doesn't matter about the other charges. The New York Times. It's a, peculiar, a peculiarity, a most dreadful peculiarity of such charges that, once made, they stick in spite of innocence. The famous detective William Burns. I insist that the charge of perversion was the very foundation of his conviction. When the press reported, uh, press, press covered a report released after his conviction, the Chicago Daily Tribune summarized, Frank, quote, is not a pervert and is innocent of the murder for which he was convicted. The primary point was not this or that particular sexual abnormality, right? Boys, girls, woods, at work, any of them, um, but rather abnormality as such. Both those who supported Frank and those who thought him guilty believed that his guilt or innocence hinged on whether or not he was a pervert, all in spite of the fact that there was no proof of sexual assault on the victim. Frank was married to a Jewish woman named Lucille, and his supporters emphasized her devotion as a way to humanize him, but also to argue for his gendered and sexual normality. The New York Times, Chicago Daily Tribune, and Washington Post printed dozens of stories about Frank and his wife together. In 1915, a New York Times article made the argument almost explicitly. Frank was neither a pervert nor guilty, and the presence of a devoted wife, his love for her, her love for him, constituted the evidence. A number of the foremost physicians at Atlanta testified by affidavit that Frank had no taint of physical or mental degeneracy. Belief to the contrary, founded on falsehood and misunderstanding, had been largely instrumental in fastening the presumption of crime upon him. The statement of Frank's patient, affectionate wife, whose testimony had been excluded at the trial of their mutual relations, of her unbroken faith in him was straightforward and its unaffected pathos must have had its due effect on the prison commission. A patient, affectionate wife who supported Frank without reservation was evidence not only as to a lack of Frank's degeneracy, but also to his innocence of the crime. Supportive newspapers also used Frank's Judaism as a way to project his innocence. Um, as an active member of a reformed synagogue known in Atlanta simply as the temple, Frank practiced a rational, decorous religion. His rabbi, David Marks, vocally supported him right from the outset and spoke to sympathetic journalists on his behalf. When the court denied Frank a retrial, Rabbi Marks stood by Frank's side and showed deep emotion, according to the New York Times. The Washington Post combined Frank's God talk and his marriage together when it printed one of Frank's letters. Surely God has let me live and aided me in this dark hour for a brighter day which must be near at hand. Mrs. Frank has been, in this painful ordeal, my ministering angel. 25 armed men came to the jail, kidnapped Frank, and drove him to Mary Fagan's hometown, where they lynched him. A crowd quickly gathered, shot photographs, and took down bits of rope and Frank's clothing as souvenirs. Much of the Georgia public, angry over a girl's murder, a particularly egregious violation of Southern genteel culture, saw the girl's death as related to a Jewish man's errant sexuality. Even in the absence of evidence of rape or sexual touching, the prosecution, the jury, and some of the non-Jewish media painted a picture of a Jewish man with abnormal gender and sexuality. 
If Leo Frank had committed the murder, he must have had a deviant sexual motive. And if Frank were sexually deviant, then he must have committed the murder, went the circular and self-justifying logic. After the 25 Knights of Mary Fagan, as they called themselves, uh, lynched Frank, Tom Watson's magazine, The Jeffersonian, announced, a vigilance committee redeems Georgia and carries out the sentence of the law on the Jew who raped and murdered the little Gentile Mary Fagan. Watson used the language of redemption to explain the violent mob, extreme rhetoric that painted the Jewish Frank as a sexual deviant and criminal. For the Jeffersonian, sexual deviance and crime were tautological. Watson suggested that Frank chose a girl, perhaps for her innocence, but also perhaps more practically because he was too weak to seek a grown woman. Both Frank's supporters and detractors imagined that his gender and sexuality had a close relationship with his guilt or innocence. For one side, he was a gentle, small, well-educated, and quiet man with a devoted wife. For the other, he was a nervous, small, weak pervert, given to the sexual pursuit of non-Jewish girls and boys. But for both sides, Frank served as an example of the intimate links of masculinity, Jewishness, and crime. 1924. On May 1st, 1924, Chicago teenagers Nathan Babe Leopold and Richard Dickey Loeb kidnapped and murdered 14-year-old Bobby Franks. They took Franks from their South Side neighborhood, killed him, poured acid onto his face and circumcised penis to hinder identification, and placed his body in a culvert. And they began to write a ransom note to the boy's parents. Although they had planned to commit a perfect crime, someone discovered the body before the ransom note reached Mr. Franks, water in the culvert washed away the acid, and Leopold dropped his custom-made glasses on the ground nearby. The police brought in the two for questioning, and they confessed to the crime. The families hired the famous charismatic attorney Clarence Darrow. The young men pled guilty, and then a protracted sentencing hearing began. The hearing would end with life sentences instead of the death penalty, which marked a significant victory for Darrow and the defendants. Unlike the Bingham Affair and Leo Frank case, everyone agreed that Leopold and Loeb were guilty and that there was something profoundly wrong with them. Jews and non-Jews alike condemned the crime and its perpetrators. How would Americans make sense of these young Jewish men? Leopold and Loeb should have presented a major challenge to the picture of American Jewish masculinity as nonviolent and gentle. The media could have portrayed a new version of Jewish male criminals. They could have adapted their pictures of Jewish masculinity to include violence or aggression. But these moves were rare. During the hearing and in the press, Jewishness, gender, and sexuality played roles in the arguments both for and against the death penalty. Both sides linked the crime with improper masculinity and sexuality. The arguments emphasized four major themes. Leopold and Loeb were abnormally gendered. They had abnormal sexuality. They were or were not mentally diseased. And they were also religiously deviant. In short, they were perverts with abnormal gender and mental functions. And as we'll see, pervert connoted both um, sexual aberration and religious deviance. But to what, extent were, to what extent were these perverts responsible for their crime? That was the question. The prosecution insisted they were fully responsible for their crimes because they were not mentally diseased, and they had therefore chosen their own religious and sexual deviation. For the defense, mental disease was the cause of sexual and religious deviation, which meant that they were not fully responsible. The crucial rule of masculinity appeared right from the start. During the earliest stages of the investigation, one reporter wrote, after an interview with Leopold and Loeb, their manly appearance and evident fearlessness were heavily in their favor. The criminals who committed the crime were not properly masculine, the reporter assumed, so if Leopold and Loeb were manly, they were unlikely to be the perpetrators. But as law enforcement found more evidence to implicate them, descriptions of their normal masculinity uh, quickly evaporated and were replaced by seemingly endless discourse about their abnormal gender and sexuality. As they seemed more likely to be culpable of the crime, so too they seemed less manly. Even before Leopold and Loeb were brought in for questioning, the newspapers fixated on the best clue, the glasses found at the scene. The Chicago Daily Tribune printed an article with the headline, Glasses near body not such as a man wears. 
A woman probably owned the pair of horn-rimmed spectacles picked up in the South Side Swamp, it read. It would be a strange man, a bit of a wizened-faced fellow, who could wear these, said one of the opticians. Not only are the circumferences of the lenses extraordinarily small for men's glasses, but the ear supports are far too short for the average masculine head. The chief of detectives explained, we know this. They were not purchased by a laboring man or a man who was employed with his hands. Those who labor physically do not need such spectacles. I am told it must have been a highly intelligent person who wore these glasses, a high-strung, nervous temperament. His statement clearly signaled the deviant gender of the perpetrator. He would have a nervous temperament, weakness, be a non-physical laborer with a small feminine face. The reading glasses had an unusual patented hinge on them, and the police identified it and tracked it back to Leopold. 10 days after the murder, Leopold and Loeb were arrested. As the case gained publicity, famous phrenologists of the time offered their expert opinions in the press. These diagnoses often accompanied diagram sketches of Leopold and Loeb's faces, where the labels explained things like, sensuous lips, excessive vanity, great love of sex, the feminine nature shows in the nose. So each one of these labels is just like pointing to a different part on the diagram of um, just like the head in profile. Uh, one diagram explained of Loeb, a phrenologist pronounces this boy of a feminine type of mind, eager for applause and easily led. A psychoanalyst explained that Loeb's head showed a balance between masculine and feminine types. Although the state asked about the young men's failed attempt to pick up prostitutes near the beginning of the hearing, it focused its questioning on the men's sexual fantasies and their vile and unnatural practices, which were sometimes coded homosexual. They dwelled on a note from Leopold to Loeb suggesting that they not quarrel publicly because people might see the agreement as, quote, a falling out of cocksuckers. One prosecutor asked Leopold several times if he had committed any acts of perversion on Loeb or another Jewish friend. In addition to asking directly, both sides paraded a series of medical witnesses to discuss the young men's physiology and its relation to their deviant sexual behaviors. The defense called the American Psychiatric Association president to explain how their overdeveloped intellect and underdeveloped bodies were consonant with their manifestations of a more or less homosexual character. So that was the defense. But then the prosecution brought in Dr. Harold Douglas Singer, director of the Illinois State Psychopathic Institution. Singer testified, my experience with such fantasies would indicate that it has a homosexual significance. Both sides agreed that the defendants had homosexual desires and experiences, and that those were relevant to the crime. Leopold and Loeb were atheists. Anyone who read the papers knew it. But why did that matter? And what did that mean for determining the extent of their guilt? Religion became important during the hearing, not as an isolated category or something merely about morality, although it was that, but as a category inextricably tied to gender, sexuality, and normality. Religious straying and sexual deviance each provided evidence for the other. Lawyers on both sides agreed that their denial of religion like their abnormal sexualities, was a bad thing. But the defense argued that these two were evidence of disease, while the prosecution claimed both were yet more evidence of their guilt. Whether the simultaneous religious and sexual straying joined their criminality as an effect of their disease, or their choice to stray from religion was a cause of their sexual and criminal behaviors, that was up for debate. What was not, however, was the fact that these three were intimately related. Leopold and Loeb provide a fascinating case of how the religious pervert and the sexual pervert were linked in the cultural imaginary. It shows how the category of religion, generically deployed, could construct criminality and sexuality. Throughout the trial, and often in the press, lawyers and writers used the term religion, which masked the slippage between generic concepts of theism and the particulars of Christianity. As both Jews and atheists, of course, Leopold and Loeb departed from both, which facilitated this slippage between the two. Although neither scripture nor practice, neither Judaism nor Christianity, became the focal point of the hearing, the Leopold and Loeb case shows how the idea of religion contributed to the constructions of both sexuality and criminality. When the press called Leopold and Loeb perverts, 
They surely had in mind the early 20th century connotation of sexual desires and practices apart from normative homosexuality, heterosexuality. Sexologists, in particular Havelock Ellis, Richard von Kraft Ebbing, and Sigmund Freud, had popularized the term perversion as an umbrella term indicating homosexuality, fetishes, and other non-procreative sexual desires and behaviors. Despite the contention of Ellis that perversion was a widespread and neutral fact of human sexuality, the term had entered popular discourse with a very negative connotation. Average newspaper subscribers who had never read Ellis nor Freud knew a pervert to be a sexual deviant. But the term perversion had a longer history. Etymologically, it just refers to a turning from, and its earliest connotations were not about sexuality, but about religious rightness. The sixth century Christian philosopher Boethius used it in this sense. By their perversion to badness, he wrote of wicked men, they have lost their true nature. For Boethius and his middle medieval interpreters and popularizers, perversion meant turning away from what was right. Pervert came to apply to an apostate who had turned away from God and church, as in 19th century descriptions of a person as a pervert from the church. This pervert could either be one who converted away from religion or had left while exp expressing dissent or critique, but both implied deviations from religious norm and community. As the state's attorney, Robert Crow, made his closing statement, these two perversions, the religious and the sexual, met in the persons of Leopold and Loeb. He sarcastically described the defense's medical experts as the three wise men. One of these three wise men, quote, this is Crow talking, was sacrilegious enough to say that this pervert, this murderer, this kidnapper, thought that he was the Christ child and that he thought that his mother was the Madonna, without a syllable of evidence any place to support the blasphemous and sacrilegious statement. Who said that this young pervert over there thought he was the Christ child? Crow referred to one of the alienists who had testified for the defense, who had told the story of Leopold seeing a church stained glass window that depicted the Madonna and Christ child and identified his own mother with Mary. In his retelling of the defense's testimony, Crow narrated an inversion of the nativity. The wise men were sacrilegious and blasphemous and they misidentified Christ. Or worse, they identified a false Christ. When Crow called Leopold this pervert, this kidnapper, this murderer, and this young pervert over there, his choice of words could allude to both Leopold's religious straying and his sexual acts. Darrow's summary also slid between Leopold's sexual perversion and his religious perversion in a way that suggested they were part and parcel of the same problem. But for Darrow, this was a medical problem, and it meant that the court should have mercy. They found out something about Leopold, his sex life, his early sex life. He had some trouble. There were endocrine disorders. There was a fantasy life. Darrow continued with the lit litany of abnormalities. His interest in religion. Your honor remembers the churches. The idea his mother was a Madonna, his aunt was a Madonna. He classified the churches, his Christ idea, his atheism. In Darrow's account, Leopold's errant sexuality and errant religion were both the results of medical abnormalities. For both the prosecution and the defense then, Leopold and Loeb fit both the religious and the sexual definitions of perversion. But they differed in their interpretation of the meaning of those perversions. Crow argued that they were both evidence of poor character and morality, while Darrow argued they were symptoms of mental disease. For Darrow and the defense, they were perverts in both the religious and sexual senses, and these were evidence of their disease. For Crow, their bad judgment in perverting themselves of God facilitated sexual perversion, as well as the kidnapping and murder. Both were evidence of their badness, but not of disease. It would then be up to Judge Calverly to decide which account of perversion and culpability he found convincing in the case of the two young Jews. Some Jews, during the hearing, some Jews expressed concern about Leopold and Loeb's religious identification. Instead of linking Jewishness to the cause of abnormality, many explained that its cause was precisely too little Judaism. The editor of the Chicago Jewish Courier wrote, if, these par if the parents of these two boys had given the children a Jewish education, if they both had borne on their shoulders individual responsibility, if they had interested themselves in Jewish problems, 
If their hearts had bled for their people, if they had been consciously Jewish with Jewish souls, they would certainly have not devoted their entire time to pleasures and good times and would not have had the possibility of going wrong. But these boys knew nothing of Judaism. Benai Brith likewise explained that the boys had come to, quote, the logical ending of those who deny the fact of God. Leopold and Loeb glory in their atheism, and it has brought them to this. Their crime was reprehensible to normal minds. Christians, too, such as the famed baseball player turned evangelist Billy Sunday, warned that precocious brains, salacious books, and infidel minds, all of these helped to produce this murder. Later that fall, a Chicago-based Lutheran, Lutheran minister diagnosed, such a crime can only come from a lack of cultivation of the moral and religious life. The kidnapping of a boy and sexual perversions, and the sexual perver perversions of the two defendants was a direct result of their perversion from religion. This dense nexus of religion and criminality and gender and sexuality cannot be neatly mapped. The Leo Frank case suggested causation. If he deviated from gender and sexual norms, then he deviated from legal norms. As Leopold and Loeb showed, both the prosecution and the defense could use nearly identical gendered constructions to incriminate or to exculpate. And one mode of perversion, religion, sex, gender, signaled other ones. The Bingham Affair shows how deviations from norms of masculinity were thought to explain and or produce criminal deviance. But only deviance of a certain sort. When Jewish men committed crimes, both Jews and non-Jews assumed they were perhaps conniving or profit-driven, but without violence, confrontation, or aggression. Jewish crimes were then not manly crimes. So how could Americans make sense of Jews who did commit violent crimes? Either they could dismiss them as singular, as they did in many of the cases of Jewish organized crime, or they could come up with another explanation of their criminality. In the Leopold and Loeb case, and for those who thought Leo Frank was guilty, that other explanation was abnormal gender and sexuality. They were perverts, and in the broadest sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. As we have some time for questions, I'm going to sort of shepherd around the microphone because this records it for our video. Um, as, as I look around, and I have a lot of questions, I know many of you do, you'll see that on the screens you've been seeing images of Bingham, of Leopold and Loeb, and of Leo Frank. And so they are some of the figures you've been looking at. So um, any questions from, uh, from the group here? I don't want to jump too far ahead of the, uh, of, of the crowd, but questions for Professor Imhoff. David. I'm sorry, Mr. Talk. Hi, David. Um, I'm curious if uh, if Darrow, Darrow, the next year argued at the famous Scopes trial, yeah, yeah, which is really about the status of you know religious knowledge in the states. I'm wondering if any any of this kind of material, or any if you looked into the kind of gendered aspects of this and the stuff that he might have carried, because it was obviously a failure here at the. I mean, right. he, he failed as a you know as a defendant, and then the Scopes trial was his great you know, great recovery, so just in sort of biographical terms, if there's any. Yeah, so, I mean, the Leopold and Loeb case was a success for him. I mean, they, they already confessed. It was a matter of making sure they didn't get the death penalty. So it was a success for him. Um, it wasn't the same kind of public relations thing that the Scopes trial would be. Interestingly enough, some of the same people, we didn't get to hear from them, but there's a, a Christian discussion between the fundamentalists and the modernists about Leopold and Loeb. And some of those same fundamentalists and modernists who are having that conversation about Leopold and Loeb, what does it mean that they're perverts, basically, although they don't all use that word, um, they're the same, some of the same people who show up and talk about the Scopes trial. Um, so it's, it seems evident to me that uh, Darrow's thinking about the cultural place of religion, although um, like a lot of the people we saw here, he's not really invested in the particulars of religion, so not particularly theology or text, um, but he's more interested in a kind of ideal of good religion that looks like a rational, decorous religion. Um, so, I, I, as I understand, you're going to have to fill me in on this, but shortly hereafter, you get uh, violent organized crime with Jews. 
So what's shifting, right? And so you get the bugsies, and you get the sort of period of serious, organized, violent um, crime. Do we see also then a shift during that period in American religious and social history where Judaism starts getting coded differently as a result? Yeah, so Jews are definitely coded different. In the larger project, I stop at 1924, and 1924 is the moment where the doors to immigration close, right? That's less interesting because of who isn't coming in and more interesting because of what that signals about the political climate of the US that's getting more and more hostile to immigrants and to others in general, right? Then we get um, the Depression, and so the, if we were charting something like anti-Semitism, um, it would go up in the late 20s and 30s. So then Judaism, less so exactly Judaism, but definitely more so Jewishness, uh, takes on more hues of criminality. You also get, I mean, even during this period, there, we're at the beginning of a period where Jewish boxers are relatively famous. Right? They would be an easy counterexample to this idea of the you know, Jews who are averse to physical activity, and yet they don't make, they don't really make a dent in this kind of discourse, even though they're present, right? So yes, there's a change that happens from, say, the mid-20s and into the 30s, but it, it's, I have to say, it surprises me how durable the gender roles are, the ideas of gender roles are. Um, so yes, there's a change, but it's not as radical a change as we might imagine it to be. In this last example, in the Leopold and Loeb, there was a little bit of kind of Christian theology that found its way in. Yeah. Um, but there's surprisingly little in what you told about the first couple. Is there any kind of specificity or content in um, Christian readings of Judaism and then the social reading of Jews and crime? Right. Um, in general, there is some, there, there's some sense in Christian readings of Judaism. In these conversations about Jews and crime, what we didn't get um, from the Bingham case, for, for instance, around the same time, there's a discussion of juvenile delinquency. And um, the Jewish community says, maybe we should have a specifically Jewish protectory, like place that we send the juvenile delinquents so that they can have um, a, a Jewish influence. Right? They say this is a couple of reasons. One is because these other religious communities are doing it. It works well for the Catholics. And another one is, gosh, we find that sometimes when Jewish juvenile delinquents go to these places, they end up getting Christianity, and we don't want that. Um, so there's this discussion that happens back and forth, and some of it crosses Jewish and Christian lines about how do we deal with this. And in that case, um, the, there's, again, this idea that generic religion will do. So someone says, um, an Episcopalian has this conversation, uh, and he says, we should, kind of, we should target Jews for conversion. And other people say, no, 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 we're Episcopalians, we're theologically past that crap. Um, we shouldn't do that. And he says, what I mean are the Jews who are atheists. What I mean are the Jews who have left Judaism. And so the Jewish community says, no, nah, don't do that. Like, don't don't target us for conversion. Um, and so they have this exchange and he basically says, yeah, great, any monotheism is good enough. Any, in fact, any theism is good enough. Um, I'm perfectly happy if you can convert those agnostic or atheistic Jews back to Judaism, that's good enough. Right? So there's again this, in that case, it's not even a differentiation among different kinds of Judaism or different kinds of Christianity, it's just the generic theism that's good enough. Thanks for the uh, talk, which is uh, very uh, engaging and thought-provoking. But it brought to mind this other series of trials happening in the same time frame and also involving a different uh, take on Judaism, especially the uh, sort of subset of Jewish atheists. And it's uh, the trial of uh, Emma Goldman and yeah. others for, in effect, kind of communist activities, lack of patriotism. Yeah. And there's something about the descriptions on the masculinity front that also track how uh, Europeans are described, overly yeah. cultured, nervous, mm -hmm. uh, not of kind of uh, physically uh, normal disposition. And so I wonder if there's that um, interplay, at least in the media and the coverage, between yeah. this whole swath of anti-communist activities that mm -hmm. are located on these especially kind of Jewish atheists, right. uh, Emma Goldman just being an interesting one because mm -hmm. it's also a vision of femininity where they're yeah. bringing her bouquets of red roses during the trial and mm -hmm. it's got an odd uh, counterpoint to uh, 
what you're talking about. So I wonder if in your research you've come across that, what you do with it when you do come across it, and is it a separate uh, vision of uh, Jews that were born elsewhere and are foreign rather than the kind of Jewish community in yeah. our midst? Yeah, um, I think you're right. I don't think it's completely different, although these cases are useful because they highlight gender in particular ways. But I think that you're right that we could say um, that many of the Jewish criminals of the time period are the kind of bomb-throwing anarchists. Emma Goldman's an interesting character because in addition to the Red Roses, the media often portrays her as a non-normative woman. Right? She's married, she's not married, she has this relationship with Alexander Berkman, she's brash, um, she's a serious political actor, she is violent. So um, I don't know if I'm ready to say, oh, we should extend this to femininity and say where we have a non-normative masculinity, we also have a non-normative femininity, but, but Emma Goldman might suggest that would be an interesting line of inquiry. Um, the, I think the European case is a really helpful comparison, in part because it's more explicitly anti-Semitic. Um, the constructions of the Jewish body there are really largely by non-Jews. And in the US, it's definitely both Jews and non-Jews, and it gets coded good and bad. And in Europe, um, much more heavily weighted toward the negative. So race science in particular thinks of Jewish bodies as kind of errant and, um, and deficient and degenerate, whereas in the US there's this um, kind of wider set of discourses. And the Jewish community really does latch on to some of these same ideas and says, oh, actually they're good things, right? It's a good thing that Jewish men aren't violent. To kind of pull you forward as well into kind of later, I know you're doing a lot of research on Israel and Zionism oh. and the relationship <laughs> there as well. So again, a question about sort of how these things shift and move. Um, does uh, uh, Zionism, the rise of that, the establishment of the state, mm -hmm. shift the way in which um, Judaism masculinity get associated and maybe even into crime, violence, these kinds of yeah, issues? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Zionism at the time has, a, has an interesting move. Uh, so in this time period that I'm thinking about, the early 20th century, it's a small minority of Jews who are American Jews who are Zionists. Um, and in part, what I want to say about that is there's this stereotype or um, idealization of the Jewish Zionist man as um, manly, right? He's physically strong, he's attached to the land, he is a productive laborer, kind of essentially. Um, and in the European Zionist narrative, that is very much attached to the desire to go settle Palestine, right? But in the US, the vast majority of American Zionists aren't in this time period, and even later, don't have any intention of going to Palestine and settling. They're supportive of the project, but then they're not gonna buy into that narrative that says, oh, it's the diaspora Jews who are weak and effeminate, right? Because they're diaspora Jews too, right? So um, as, as the state of Israel comes into existence, then it becomes a way the, the Zionist Jew, the Sabra, the, um, the kind of native Israeli, who we can now associate with Israeli stereotypes of strong men and strong women and, um, and militarization and things like that. So that becomes, I'm not sure that it becomes um, uh, something that really pulls this description of masculinity in a different direction. It kind of becomes an alternative one, right? Like, so we still have Woody Allen. Um, but then we also, <laughs> but then we also have um, the image of like Ari Ben Kanan or whatever um, from Exodus. But don't watch the movie; it's really long and awful. But but that's <laughs> but that's the stereotype of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm. I, yeah, we could imagine a version where like oh we get this Zionist and it kind of pulls Jewish masculinity in another direction. But I think instead we just kind of get multiple Jewish masculinities at that point in the American scene. Thank you for your talk. I, were, I don't know if I missed something, but I wonder, like, is there, 
was the argument that there was something unfair about their trials that that bringing those things in made that that part unfair or was it that the whole way that it was uh, reported had an effect on general perceptions yeah I mean I'm less interested in fair and unfair there's there's plenty written about the Leo Frank case you know the trial seems patently unfair and I'm more interested in seeing what kinds of things even people on op arguing opposite things kind of agreed about right um, it's not instantly obvious that sexuality should matter in a kidnapping and murder case Right. Um, and yet it did, and it did profoundly for both sides. And so I'm really interested in what does that mean about the cultural ideas about Jewishness if those get taken for granted, even by two sides who are set up to be in, con in contrast. Right. Um, so yes, while I think it's totally reasonable to say that Leo Frank had an unfair trial, that point has been made, and I think it tells us, I think this gets to tell us something more interesting about gender and religion and Jewishness in the time period. Bank of the United States in 1930, oh, which is yeah. run by two Jewish New York bankers. They, it's, a, it's an immigrant bank, yeah. uh, but it has a big, you know, the, the bank crashes. There's a run, and it's said to be one of the major impetuses of all the rest of the bank crashes. And it's blamed, uh, you know, at least in certain quarters in the public press on the Jews. Yeah. And it's, of course, a soft crime, bank and crime, like par excellence. So, and the other question was about socialism and about, you know, yeah. persecution of Jews, sort of anti-capitalists. But there's, of course, a lot of American yeah. anxiety uh, about Jews and Jewish men in particular as capitalists and therefore worshippers of right. mammon. It's a really great intersection yeah. of religion and in this case capitalism. I was wondering if that features yeah. or factors into the bigger research yeah. project. I mean, I think it doesn't, it doesn't in particular in this research project, but I think you could make a good argument about that. And that one also has all of these contemporary resonances, right? Like all you need is Bernie Madoff to, um, to, <laughs> to think about the way that those stereotypes work. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that Jews end up serving as both uh, a stand-in for capitalism and also a stand-in for socialism, right? Um, yeah, I think, I think that you can make a really interesting argument. I don't know quite enough about the primary sources there to do it, but I think that you're right that, it's, that we could fit that into a similar story about the kinds of criminality that Jews are up to. Um, I'm not sure if I'm repeating a question from earlier, but I just wanted to know when when um, people were describing Meyer Lansky in like the 30s, were they were they interpreting it as like some kind of soft crime, or did they did they own up to the uh, fact that he was a violent? They criminal? definitely, yeah, they own up to the fact that he's a violent criminal, and then they do this thing where they say, well, he's an aberration, right? Like he's just he's like a one of a kind. No matter how many of the like, no matter how much Jewish organized crime is, like, well, like that's a that's a special case. That's a one-off case, right? Um, and then there you can see some of this kind of similar language about, oh, getting away from Judaism means you're, you're opening yourself up to crime. But um, yeah, there's a funny way that, that organized crime doesn't constitute the same kind of crisis for the Jewish community that, that say, Theodore Bingham making up this wrong statistic did, which is, I think, pretty remarkable. <laughs> So I'm curious, when you speak of sexual deviance being linked intrinsically to religious deviance, yeah. I'm curious how much of a role you think that has to do with theism specifically, the belief in God, as opposed to just deviance maybe from the Jewish community, generally Jewish values, dissociating oneself from the Jewish community. So right. how much is, is theism important to that definition of religious deviance in, in linking it to sexual deviance? You know, um, I think if we just looked at the Jewish community, it might be tempting to say, well, it's about deviation from community, perhaps. But when we look at the Christian conversations, too, the Christian conversations, um, like I, I mean, sort of like I mentioned before, a lot of them pick up on Judaism being good. Like, Judaism's good. If you were really a, a good Jew, right, if you really believed in God, if you were really a practitioner of Judaism, then you wouldn't have done this, right? So that's the Episcopalian. Um, rector who's like, oh, we should convert Jews. I just mean the ones who don't believe in God and the Jewish community says, no, 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 right? But he thinks that Jews who believe 
in God and practice Judaism are good enough, right? Like that's, that's good. Um, so I don't, I'm not 100% sure that it's actually theism, but the language of God comes up enough that I'm tempted to say that it's theism. And there seems to be this consensus that religion in general, by which they mean something that looks like theism, um, is good enough to be either a deterrent to crime or even a deterrent to impressions of crime. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. It seems, to, it seems totally reasonable to us that we would say, oh, well, it's about deviation from Jewish community, it's about deviation from Jewish values, but they don't quite talk about it that way. It seems like religion, religion is good enough. It doesn't really matter which stripe. <laughs> Any final questions? Well, I hope you'll uh, join me in thanking uh, Professor Imhoff for a wonderful talk. We have a uh, gift and a uh, Oh, thank you, Ben. Thank you.